the Jews of the law. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, all God's people said, Amen. Father, you have given us so many, so many opportunities to hear the gospel. That Christ has died, Christ has risen, and Christ will come again. Tonight set us free that we won't go back to the way we were, but be renewed in the power of the Spirit. That we walk in spirit, not in the flesh. That with all the opportunities we're given, that we don't need another one, because tonight is the night of salvation for all of us. Please, God, for all who are listening around the world, we, we welcome them. But may all come to the knowledge of the truth, the Lord Jesus Christ, and be saved. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, the world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, all God's people said, Amen. Chapter 1, Chapter 2, Chapter 3, Chapter 4 of Romans is only introduction. The book of Romans really starts in chapter 5 about our salvation. And then Paul gets in to really follow our salvation, he got the Holy Spirit. Then Paul bemoans the, bemoans the facts, what are going to happen to the Jews at the end of time? And so we got really some exciting things to share with us about. But in chapter 1, Paul goes to the Gentiles. Chapter 1, verse 18, he says, Gentiles can be saved if they were tuned into creation speaking to them. Now when you turn from the living God, what do you do? This is the dawning of the age. Remember those days? Anybody ever hear the 60s? Yes. You, you weren't alive back then? I was. Do, 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 do. Give me such a peace, my you don't remember those days? Yes. Anybody remember the bell bottoms? Yes. And the turtleneck shirts? Yes. And the, you know, the bell bottoms? And the quaffs on people's heads? You forgot about those days. And the beads? Okay. You, uh, you, 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 okay. How many know some of you were really wild back then? Now the Bible says when we turn from God, we get into astrology. Now, in chapter 1, verse 18, the Gentiles have, number one, they have creation to bring them to God. Number two, what we read last week, everybody in the world has something inside your heart. It's called the natural law, which is that your conscience which says when you, when you do something terrible, you're bothered by it. How many ever did something and you were bothered by it? And maybe you weren't particularly a, a church goer, but you did something and said, that's really not right. Mm -hmm. And maybe your conscience got the better of you. Mm -hmm. Now the Jewish people, the only difference as we get to chapter three tonight, the only difference is it was handed to them. They had the Torah. The Jewish people always believed that the Torah pre-existed. But Catholics do because we read John chapter one. The word pre-existed. Jesus is the Logos. So now, Paul's going to tell them, we Gentiles have the natural law. The Jewish people have the written law. The people who are Gentiles don't seem to follow the natural law too well. We violate it. We break our conscience all the time. The Jewish people have to deal with 613 teachings. And what do they do? Scream. We can't keep that. So guess what happens with the Gentiles and the Jews? We can't keep it. Now you know why that expression that Paul repeats, first the Jews, then the Greeks. That expression, first the Jews, mean first we were the one, they were the ones. It started with Father Abraham in 1850 BC. Who was the first pure Jew in the world? Isaac, because in Genesis 17 he got circumcised. So he's called the first pure Jew ever, Yitzhak. And so we're all in the state of what? So when we get to chapter three, what are we gonna find out? We have all what? Sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So now you gotta keep all of these three chapters together so you can understand the full text. And now Paul is gonna zero in, in verse 17, to his fellow Jews. And the fellow Jews, when they were confronted with the Lord Jesus, they didn't like him. Because Jesus came and 
he said in Matthew chapter 5, you've heard it said, meaning the scriptures, but I say to you, meaning I'll interpret the word of God for you. And his interpretation just made everyone walk backwards. For example, how many here know in, in Matthew 5 that if you look at a woman without touching her, without saying her, you can, you can commit a mortal sin? You can touch the person and you can say, whoa, look at her baby. It's going on inside your mind. And you can say, whoa, baby. If I had my chance, she'd be mine. <laughs> Amen? Guess what? You committed a mortal sin. No, you just said your thoughts are sins. Right. No, the temptation is. But when it's conceived in your heart, James chapter 1, verse 12. Right. Are you getting that? Yes. Now, I never heard anybody say that before. Have you? How many ever say, my, my thoughts are wild? How many, how many need? And watch out for old men. They like to wear hats. <laughs> And when they wear hats, how many know it gets dirty on the inside? <laughs> Amen? Why? Because they're sweating? No. Nah. <laughs> look, at, look at verse 17. Everybody with me now? But if you call yourself a Jew and rely upon the law and boast of your relationship to God, did they all do that? Yes. Now, everybody circle the word law. How do you say law in Greek, Miss Pat? Nomos. Very good. Nomos. N O M O S. I say that in Hebrew? Torah. You've heard that before, haven't we? Mm -hmm. Now, you rely on the... You rely on 613 laws. But there's no true Jew that can say to me today, I told you I worked with this wonderful Orthodox rabbi. He said, Father Bill, I can keep the law. But you know what he said? I'll try. But you know what he kept saying? I said, Rabbi, were you successful this year? No. But I'll try. And he told me, and I just went like this. He said he believes that St. Paul said that if you keep the law, you could be saved. Okay, that's true. Can anybody here keep 613 commandments for the rest of your life? Anybody want to sign up for that? No. Can I advise you? Just call out for one word. Mercy. Amen? Don't sign up for that, please. How many would like to be perfect for the rest of your life? I know most of you are, but... Uh, especially if you become a woman in your 70s. They don't sin anymore. They will tell me they don't sin. I say, you don't sin? That's tough. That's amazing. When was your last confession? Ten years ago. You didn't sin ten years ago. <laughs> You are just amazing grace, how sweet the sound. <laughs> the second thing is, they boasted in their relationship to God. Why? What was their relationship to God? They boasted in their heritage. They boasted in Abraham, Genesis 12, 1, 2, and 3. They boasted, we are, we are, the, we are the sons of Abraham. We are the daughters of Abraham. So they boasted. So now, i got 613 laws. I can't keep them. Um, Abraham is my father of faith. Genesis 15, 6. So, how many think you're going to heaven on those things? Yeah. Now, can I repeat something to us? Mm. You're not going to heaven because you're good. Right. And you know what? I, I cry because you think, you, you heard that growing up your whole life. You see, the people that you work with, they don't go to church. Why? Because they're good people and they're going to go to heaven. Who told them that? Then Paul goes on to say this, verse 18, and know his will. So I can boast, I know the will of God. The will of God, and approve what is excellent because you were instructed in the law. The law is good. But guess what? If God said to me, my son, take this book, these 73 books in the Catholic, and, and live it perfectly for the rest of your life, and you go to heaven. I couldn't do it. This is a part of me like some blast some people. <laughs> Amen. So I said, God, now circle the word excellence. 
The word excellence means, as Paul would say later in Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, it means climbing the ladder of all the virtues and seeing God at the top waiting for you. So what would the Jews say? We're in because we're going to climb the ladder. How many remember somebody with the ladder? Yaakov, Jacob. And the word ladder, I'll write it on the board for you. S-U-L-A-M, Sula. That's the, word, the Hebrew word for a ladder. And it was tilted like this. And angels were going up and down, up and down. And when Jacob had his vision, he would look on the top, and there was God. And so he had to name this, the name of the town called Bethel, House of God. I've seen God. And they were going to move the Ark of the Covenant later on, right next door to a place called Shiloh. And Shiloh means Messiah. The coming of the Messiah. Interesting, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So, how many would like to see here, you are instructed in the law, verse 19, if you are sure that you are a guide to the blind, does that sound like the Pharisees? Yeah. Does that sound like the world of religion? Yes, I'm obliged to the God. To, and she, but Jesus said in a little parable X, how come the, the blind need the blind? And they both fall into the pit. You see, if I'm leading you, that means you get to see. That means you're safe. And with the kids, we always practice these drills. You know, they're blindfolded and they're walking through. A, I was just down in Trenton. You ever hear of Trenton? Mm -hmm. And I had to wait for an hour for the kids to do these blindfolded drills. And then what they would do is when they were walking and being led somebody, they would bash cans and make noise and try to scare the bejeebers out of the kids so that they would scream. I didn't make up that dynamic, so don't blame me. But yet, they need to be led and they, they were trying to teach the kids, the world's scary. Be led by me and trust me. So here's the blind. And who's, the, who's blind? The world of religion. What's the world of religion? What is the heaviest thing you can experience? It's going to church on Sunday. And you're heavy when you come in. I don't mean pound-wise. And you're heavy when you lose. You have no sense of being relieved. You have so, no sense of freedom. It's because you practice the spirit of religion. It's a spirit of heaviness. What does the spirit of religion mean? You go through all the actions, but you're not changed at all. Do you think our people are going through that? I believe so. Then Paul goes on to say there, uh, you're like to those in darkness, a corrector of the foolish, a teacher of the children, having the law, the embodiment of knowledge and truth. When Jesus was going through school, only boys would go. And all the girls would never go because they had to stay home with their mothers. And Jesus, back then, with his schoolmates, they would have to memorize the Torah in Hebrew. Can you imagine that? They would have to memorize, and they had a way of getting the kids to eat their alphabets. Because they would have a letter in Hebrew, and every time you got one right, you get to, it's, it was candy, you get to eat it. That's the way to get kids to eat it. Make Hebrew letters, and everybody will learn that. Mm, yeah. Mm. I would like letters of all M&Ms. I'd eat them all up, you know? But here's what they did. Here's, here's what it means to be Jewish. Embodiment of knowledge. And when, when you teach others, will you not teach yourself? How come you're teaching them to follow God and you don't keep it? It would be like me up there preaching to you. Don't do this and don't do that and don't commit adultery and stop the cursing. <laughs> Meanwhile, when I, when I leave church, I'm cursing and I'm committing adultery. Don't you teach yourself? So here they're, 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 they're trying to lead those who called themselves blind, but they themselves were blind. This is the world of the Jews. Now, remember what year did Jesus die? 30, very good. I answered my own question. Jesus said, I told you in Luke chapter 21, that the Jewish world will fall apart. And, when the, and Paul's writing this, what years? In the middle of the 50s. And what happened to the world of religion? It became so chaotic like it is now. And people didn't know what to believe. Welcome to the world of today. Amen? 
You get discouraged. I have family members. You know why they don't want to go to church? Because of what they see. They have nothing against any of the teachings. Nothing. I'm not going because of what I say. I'm not going near that place. So how many know I got some homework to work on? Because they practice all this world of religion. Pomposity. I, I made up that word. Is that a good word? Pomposity. They're pompous. And so what happened between the year 30 and 70? What year are we in now? We're in the 50s. And what happened? What did, what did Jesus say? Does everybody know what happened during those 40 years? One more generation? Outright chaos in the world of religion. Who, what, what, what did they do? They took an animal and they did what? Sacrificed it. And what was that doing? It was smack against the cross because Hebrews chapter 9 says, how many sacrifices are there? And so the world of religion, the blood was flowing. And who came in to be high priest? Anybody who could gamble their way in. Now, do you understand what Paul is saying now? You're going to lead the blind? You can only lead somebody. Ready for this? Put a big note there. You can only lead somebody if you don't do it. I can't lead you if I'm getting drunk. You know what's wrong with our church? You want men up there. I, I, I'm speaking for you. I hope I'm correct. How many want men up there that are really, really holy? That you look at them and you say, what an example. How many want men like that? Anybody? And how many know you want to be close to them? And how many know you want their advice? But when you don't see them living it, they're just, and by the way, anybody up there, you don't want them like you. Because you know what you are and your heart is all alike. You want somebody that's living for God. Because you're going to have need of getting like that. Are, are you following? And so here we can see, brothers and sisters, the people are, are in trouble. Look, while you preach against stealing, do you steal? Verse 22, you say that one must not commit adultery. Do you commit adultery? Now, these are all called rhetorical questions. In other words, you know the answer to all of them, right? So what's the leadership doing in the 50s? They're doing this. They're, the religion's gone. Now, here's the good point about that. Finally, I could step in and preach the gospel now. When you don't believe in anything and you believe in all the scandals, the man that I buried today, his wife says, Father Bill, you led him to Christ. And so changed was he, he led other people to Christ, and they were there. And so it was, he, he was converted. And you know, by you leading him to Christ, my marriage changed. I had marriage. And I didn't know all these things were happening until today or yesterday or whatever. Isn't that good? So the world of religion makes things a mess. Because I'm telling you to do this. In the book of um, Zephaniah, you ever hear of Zephaniah? Yes. Chapter 1, verse 5. Down below, they would practice the world of religion. At night, they would go up and worship the stars. In Haiti, they go to Mass on Sunday, and then they go around the corner to their voodoo doctor. What's wrong with that picture? Don't do that, but I go. He says there, look at verse number 23. You abhor idols, do you rob temples? You see, the world of religion, I shouldn't tell you this too loud, can make me very rich. Is that what Martin Luther saw? I can be very rich right now. Ladies and gentlemen, you know what? I'm going to do something for all of you. Uh, $10 each. And you trust me? Okay, good. Ten, ten. One, two, three, four. Look at how much money yes, I'm getting it in. So I rob. I rob the temples. And when was the temple robbed? If you underline that special, rob the temples. 
When was the temple robbed? In 586 BC, who robbed the temple? How many ever heard of a man called Nebuchadnezzar? He came into the temple in 586 BC, and you know what he did? He robbed the temple, and what did he do? He went into the back section of the sanctuary, and he took out the chalices, and he made them, he, he drank beer in them. And in Daniel 5, one of his sons, Balthazar, he was drinking one day, and there was a handwriting that appeared on the wall. Your time is up. So, many, many technical parson. And so, what, what does it mean to rob temples? It means we've done what the people who are against us do. They go in, they want our churches destroyed. How many have ever seen, anybody here see one of your churches close? Anybody have one of your churches close? Can I tell you why our churches are closing? Because there's no spirituality. Can you see the attendance going down? There's no spirituality. Can you see the money going down? There's no spirituality. Amen, are you getting this? So what are we doing? We're robbing the temple. We're robbing the temple, amen? Yes, uh, what is your name? Ashwamani. Ashwamani. But does Paul know this oh so well? He's writing. He knows this oh so well, yes. Yes, he could. Absolutely. So could. that's why he's only in on the Jews for this? That's right. But yet in Philippians, he says, I kept it meticulously, but I wasn't. You know what he says when I kept it so meticulously? He used a French word, garbage. Chapter 3, verse 8 of Philippians. He said, hey, It's all worthless. So, how many here are practicing a religion just going through the motions? Amen? Are, are you following what I'm saying? There's no change in you. There's no change in you. Then he says there, verse 23, you boast in the law. We love the law. How do you say that in, in Hebrew? Torah. How do you say that in Greek? Nomos. We love the law. Do you dishonor God by breaking the law? And what were they there? They were there. How many know there was the Torah police? I'm making that up. <laughs> and what did the Torah police do? They went so crazy that they made laws protecting the law. Is that nuts? So they said to Jesus, uh, your disciples are, um, they didn't wash their hands and they're eating corn. They're rubbing it and they're, they're eating wheat. Did they say their little bread and fish prayer? So they made laws to protect the laws. So what became their walk in God? Not the law, but the laws to protect the laws. Right? Amen? And that became their religion. How close were they to God? Farther and farther away. Are you getting this? Then he says, for it is written, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Now, how many remember a blasphemy? There was a blasphemy, the reason why uh, in, in Numbers chapter 20, Moses didn't go into the promised land. Because God said to him, speak to the rock. What did he do? He struck it. How many know there's a difference between speaking and striking? <coughs> and why did he go into the promised land? Because he made fun of God's name in front of the people. And why can't the Gentiles become Jews then? There was a few proselytes, as we can read in Acts chapter 2 on Pentecost Sunday. There's a few people that was interested in becoming Jews, even going under circumcision. How many of them would you high sea for a while? But why did more come in? Because they saw hypocrisy. They saw irreligion. If you look at Titus, which will be a, uh, it will be a reading on Christmas from the book of Titus, practicing irreligion. And irreligion is so detrimental, it can damn your soul. So they practiced this irreligion to the utmost. And how close were they to God? farther and farther away. Can I tell you that's happening right now? Yes, sir. Father, St. Paul fully knew the disposition of their hearts 
Yes. Yes, he fully knew that. Paul knew this fully, yes. But can you see it now? Yes. Give us holy priests. Give us holy sisters. Give us men and women who are holy. And I want to be in their class. I want to be with them, amen? So guess what happens? Because of their irreligion, what did the Gentiles do? Can't stand those people. Uh, I don't want to go near those people. So if anybody says, because of the bad example we give, they don't want to go near us, you just block somebody from heaven. Well, I wonder if anybody said that about us. <coughs> Verse number 25. Now he gets to the real crux of it all. Circumcision indeed is of value if you obey the law. You want to be circumcised? By the way, where is circumcision in the Bible? Genesis 17. What does circumcision mean? It means that if we're going to let the Jewish race continue, you've got to take the knife and where the seed would get the family to grow, you've got to cut off right on the male. And when you cut it off, it's a sign that now he can enter in to a relationship with a woman and sp continue to spread the faith that way. Now, in Romans 10, 17, the faith is only through what? Thanks be to God. The faith is right here in the mouth. Isaiah 52, 7, what's the faith? The faith is proclaiming it. How many think that's a whole lot better than circumcision? So Paul says, if you're circumcised, you've got to enter into the whole law. Now, Jesus was circumcised on the eighth day, wasn't he? Luke chapter 2. Why was he circumcised? Because somebody had to obey all 613 to appease God. If God gave all these laws, and he did, and if nobody was able to keep it, and nobody was except Jesus, Mary, if they couldn't keep it, then God's word would be totally void. I went to my rabbi once, and I said, Rabbi, you know what I discovered? He said, what's that, Father Bill? There's only one person who kept the Torah. He said, who's that? I said, Jesus. And you know what he said to me? You're right. He said, only Jesus. And now here's a Jew talking about another Jew, Jesus. And he said, only Jesus kept all 613 laws. He admitted it. And I said, I know. Circumcision, verse 25, is a value if you obey it, but if you break the law, your circumcision becomes uncircumcision. So you want to be circumcised? Genesis 17? You want to pass down your faith? You can only pass down your faith if you keep what God is saying. How do you, how most of you grew up keeping your faith? Go to church. How many ever did that one? Do you think you passed down the faith by saying that? You need church. Go to church. You haven't been to church in a hundred. Does that really help them to obey? How many think so? I don't think so. Some of us still try that tactic. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. You know what, my, what tactic I use? Jesus died on the cross for you, man. Isn't he worth going? Yes. I said, that's the end of my sermon. I, I want them to see Christ. So all your circumcision, if you can't keep this, your circumcision in vain. Next he says there, verse 26. So if man, now circle the word man there. Remember, man is, this is a generic word. This is the Jewish word. And he's going to use this again in Romans 7. He, he, he says to us there, So if a man who is uncircumcised keeps the precepts of the law, will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? Who is he referring to? Us. Do you know the Jewish people believe that we can be saved? We believe they can. <laughs> Through the, what it's called, I'll give you the, I'll give, here, let me write it on the board. Noah. Put in Noah and I-D-E. Noah. N-O-A-H-I-D-E. Noahide. Now before Noah, how many people were saved on that ark? Eight. Sailing, sailing, 
over the mount, over the mountain Ararat. Remember, how were they saved? They say, well, because God put them inside. Yeah, that's true. But let's go deeper. How were they saved? They kept the law. Did they have the 613 laws revealed to them? No. They were all what? Gentiles. Who's the first pure Jew? Isaac. Who started the Jewish race? Abraham. Genesis 12. This is in, this is in chapter 6, chapter 7, chapter 8, chapter 9 of Genesis. So, were the eight people saved? Yeah. Who were they? Noah, Mrs. Noah, Shem, Japheth, and who else? And Ham, and he had a brother called Cheese. So we have, we have Japheth, Shem, and Ham, right? And their wives, eight people. Only, why were they, why were they saved? They were saved for one reason. They lived the best they could in a righteous manner. And if you want to know what the ark looked like, come home with me and I'll show you MetLife Stadium, Giant Stadium, whatever you call it. That's about the size of it. That's about the size of what they did. So before the law came, there were people saved. Are you getting, are you getting what St. Paul is saying here? So, uh, look what he says, verse 27. Those who are physically uncircumcised but keep the law will condemn you for the written code and the circumcision but break the law. Put in there, that is the only difference between being Jewish and Gentile. They had it first. What do we keep reading? The Jews what? First. Then the Greeks. What do the Greeks mean? It means those, those who, were, who were intelligent, those who were educated, those who knew. So, what do we have here? Who, who are the redeemed and who are the saved? But how many think that Paul's fellow Jews are enjoying this lesson right now? Do you think they like him right now? Wait a minute. You're telling me, what did they call us back in the first century? Dogs. You hear that expression? You dirty dogs. Matthew 15. What did that lady say, the Syrophoenician woman to Jesus? Even the dogs go to the table for crumbs. And what was, why did she say dog? Because you Jews call us dogs. And she said, this is one dog that wants to have a crumb. Heal my daughter. She's demonized because you just came into the area of Tyre with witchy poo there. And I need help. I am a desperate mother and I have, I have three kids. I am desperate. I am desperate for help. Amen? So what did Jesus do to that one demonized daughter? She was healed. So now, this is really wild. I'm Jewish. I got the Torah. I got everything. Didn't Paul say that in Philippians 3? I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews, I'm a Pharisee of Pharisees. I got parents, I got mothers and fathers, I got it all. But guess what? I don't have salvation, I'm empty. Because what mass are you going to? Let's get it over with, get it over with. I hope it's not Father Bill, get it over with, get it over with. Personally, all those who are leaving early, I doubt if they're on the road to salvation. I have my doubts. I have my doubts. Always leaving early, thinking they did something. Who told them that? I surely didn't. I take my name off the list. So how many think this is, this is eye-opening eye and this is a shock? Do you think Paul got Hanukkah cards that year? And you know what Paul never, 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 never told them? Paul never told them to leave Judaism. Never told them to do that. Amen? Okay, now, next, go with me. Uh, uh, the written code, what's the written code, everybody? The Torah, right? Circumcision, but break the law. How many times are you allowed to break the law for you? How many times? You break it once, you're gone. You have to keep perfectly 613. Can you do that? My rabbi has them all memorized. All 613 laws. Is them all memorized. Wow. Wow. What, what, what I should do is, but I, I need about 10, 10, 15, 20 pages each. 
you can go online now and put in the, the, the 613 laws if you want to see them all. And, and run them off. You get sheet after sheet after sheet after sheet after sheet after sheet after sheet. And just read them, you're like, now that's what it means to be Jewish Orthodox today. Take that, put it in your hand. That's a Jewish person today who's Orthodox. You know what I mean? The guys dressing black with their, their, their ladies and everything else. That's the esteem. Put that in your hand. And now, look at that and put another little thing in there, plus the interpretation. So, you look at all those things and say, well, what does this mean for me in 2016? And then you got, guess how much more you got? Okay, now, to be a true practicing Jew, you got to take this and all this. How many would just want to be Jewish right now? I told you, I was doing Mass today, one, one Jewish man said, hey, Father Billy, he said, yeah, when I die, you can come to my synagogue and do my funeral. I said, I'll come. So, what would you do? How many want to go into the world of religion back then? And that was it for the first century. Amen? Are you getting this? For he's not a real Jew, he's one outwardly. Now, outwardly means externals. Amen? You are not a, a Catholic if you just go through the motions on the outside. You know, in our church we have conservative people. And I believe I'm very conservative. I try to be joyful. <laughs> But when, when you, you're, you're, a, you're a conservative person and you won't, you won't greet a person and say the peace be to you, because I don't believe in the sign of peace. But I love God. I said, no, you don't. You can't even share, share peace with somebody. Oh, I don't believe in that stuff. But when you go out, you look like you, you got stung by 20 bees. <laughs> and, and you're going around practicing in this world of religion. So just because you're one outward, that doesn't make you a Christian. Next he says there, good stuff. Then he says, he is a Jew. Nor is true circumcision something external or physical. How many want to be truly circumcised? It's your heart. Jeremiah says in chapter, chapter 17, our hearts are torturous. Everyone here. Now you all look good. You probably all got to pay yourself extra squirts. But when it really comes down to the real men and women we are, our hearts are torturous. What goes through our filter of the heart sometimes is incredible, isn't it? Look at that one over there. Oh. And here we are. Amen? Are you getting this? Now he says, verse 29, He is a Jew who is one inwardly. Real circumcision is a matter of the heart. Underline the word heart. Let's put the word in. Cardia. How many ever heard of cardia? And what does cardia mean? Your emotions. How many of most of us have we're emotional wrecks? That's why we've got a pop a pill tonight, the green one, the blue one, the orange one, whatever color you're up to now. <laughs> Amen. Next, who you're spiritual. <laughs> and this is not literal. Do you think Paul's getting a good audience here? His praise is not from men, but from God. I've got to do it God's way because in Acts chapter 5, verse 32, we must obey God rather than men. Now, as we go into chapter 3, then he says there, what advantage has the Jew? What's the difference between being Jewish and Christian, or a Jew or a Gentile? Or what is the value of circumcision? What's the answer of circumcision? What's the value? No value. None. There's no value to it. Now we're going to find in chapter 6 the value of baptism. But there's no value to being circumcised. When did Jesus end the law? He fulfilled it, Matthew chapter 5, amen? When did he end all Jewish laws? You don't have to be kosher anymore. How many of some people are kosher? By the way, it's healthier to be kosher. You're not supposed to eat lobsters. You're not supposed to eat um, all the, the cold cuts. Anybody kosher here? You're not supposed to eat um, pork. Okay? Okay? Uh, and if you want to find out what's really kosher, Leviticus 11 and 14. Leviticus chapter 11 and chapter 14. Now what did Jesus do? Let, let's find out that he, he fulfilled all of this. Matthew 5, I told you. Now, let's go to Mark 7. Make a left. This is good stuff.
Let's show you when Jesus ended all kosher laws. Mark 7, please. Mark 7. Let's go to verse 9, please. And we're going to zero in around verse 19. I'll read it fast. I want to show you where you don't have to follow kosher laws. Some of you say, thank you, Lord. I like my bacon. Anybody like bacon? Mm-hmm. Do you like bacon, man? Okay. Okay, everybody with me? Verse 9. He said to them, you have the fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to keep your tradition. Tradition, 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 tradition. For Moses said, what does Moses mean there? It means Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Honor your father and your mother, and he who speaks evil father and mother, let him surely die. How many know many of your kids would be dead already? How many know all of your kids probably would be under a pile by now? Would your daughter be under a pile? Probably not. Yeah, she's great. Amen? So keep working, you've got a lot more pains to make. Amen? I, I was with my, my nephew, he's 21. I said, Maddie, I'm praying for you every day. You know what he said to me? He said, Uncle Bill, you're probably the only person in the world praying for me. Wow. And you know what? He's right. Wow. He's right. Mm-hmm. I said, I'll keep, I got plans for you, kid. <laughs> but you say, if a father tells his mother or father, what would you give for me, Corbin? Corbin means dedicated to God, that you no longer permit him to do anything for his father and mother, thus making void the word of God for your tradition, 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 tradition. You hand on, and many such things you do. And he called the people to him again and said, Hear me, all you, and understand there is nothing outside a man which can make him defile him. Amen? No bacon can make you defiled. Good, I like bacon. Let's have a bacon sandwich tonight. Mm-hmm. But the things which come out of the man defile him. All right, now underline this. Jesus is changing the kosher laws right there. Okay, good stuff. And when he, oh, by the way, when you're talking to Jewish people, be gentle. Be gentle. Uh, verse 17, and when he had entered the house and the people, he asked his disciples, him, asked him about the parable, and he said, Though the, then you are without understanding, do you not see that whatever goes into a man from outside cannot defile him? since it enters not his heart, but his stomach, and so passes on. Put a big star there. Thus, he declared, all foods clean. What does all mean? All. Right there, no kosher laws. Do you see it right there? So when you're talking to a Jewish person, be gentle, if they're gonna keep the kosher laws, fine. Now may I recommend, if you're, gonna, if you, if you're eating with a Jewish friend, and he or she is doing kosher, May I invite you to practice a little act of charity? Don't eat bacon in their presence. Okay, can we practice charity? Okay, so I'm gonna have sausage. I'm going out with my Jewish friend for breakfast. I'm gonna have sausage, syrup, and butter, and bacon, and sauce, and, and syrup, and butter. Okay, can I recommend that when you're with a person of a different world religion, do not impose your, your particular belief that well, Jesus set us free and too bad for you. No. Practice a little charity, okay? Amen. But why would they believe what Jesus said about the kosher laws? Who? The Jews. They don't. They don't have Mark chapter 7. But I just want to show you that the laws, circumcision is what? Meaningless. But I want to show you right there, did you put a star in? No kosher laws. But may I recommend, they are very good too. Amen, Miss Anna. Yeah, Muslims, Muslims do the same thing. When I was at San Antonio, and they knocked on my door for food. Um, you know, I don't ask, oh, by the way, are you Muslim? I said, I said no, I said, I ha- we just had ham last night, would you like a ham? No. Mm-hmm. No. I am a Muslim. I said, well, that's all I have right now. And I, I understand that you don't eat ham. I said, oh, the only thing I have is peanut butter and jelly. 
And then I had a, a, a woman, she sounded like she was from England. She says, I am hungry. I said, oh, then I have ham. Every, every time people knock on my door, I have ham for dinner. I don't know what to do. And, and so, so, we said, uh, so I said to her, oh, well, I got ham. And she goes, I don't want it. I said, well, that's all I have. So you've got to starve them because that's all I have. She says, I'll take it. I said, I'm glad you're singing my way. All right. <laughs> okay, back, with, back when we were in Romans. Are you getting this? Okay, good stuff. Romans 3. Now, so what does the band translate? Look at much in every way, verse 1. To begin with, the Jews are entrusted, underlined entrusted. That, remember, entrusted means a banking term. Entrusted with the oracles of God. That's the only difference. What are the oracles of God? The prophecies, the Bible, the, the Old Testament. So put in there the Old Testament. They have it, and we didn't have it. We were grafted on. That's why we're going to see what's going to happen to the Jews as Jesus gets ready to come. Next he says, what if some were unfaithful? Does their faithlessness nullify the faithfulness of God? No. One thing, God is always what? Faithful. Remember in the book of Timothy, chapter 2, God is always faithful. Even if we're unfaithful, God is faithful. God is true. Yes? Then he says there, um, by no means, let God be true, though every man be false. Amen? That you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. May my words stand up. That when, when I'm justified, that means I can stand before the living God. And then if my words are absolutely true, if my lifestyle is absolutely true, I'm going to be what? Look what happens. I'm going to prevail. I can stand up when I'm judged. Now, how many here believe you're saved by God? If you're saved by God, it means you're going to be able to stand up in front of God on judgment day and by yourself because I won't be there. I'm already in. <laughs> And I said, Lord, I told him, you let me in right now, Lord. You let me in. And uh, you, you've got to stand in front of God. And you've got to be justified by your faith. That you have in your heart the faith that will save you. The faith that's real. The faith that's practiced. The faith that's believed in. The faith that's alive and well. The faith that takes care of people. The faith that, that, that really is active in the spirit of God. The faith that just sits in, sitting on your Oaxaca. It's a, a faith that's in movement. Uh, it, it's a Galatians 5, 6 kind of faith. Everything working out through love. Then I can be justified. Then I can stand in front of God. Then I can say, Lord, you can let me in. Why, Bill, should I let you in? Because I live before you what you told me to do. And I have trusted Christ and the power of the Spirit upon me. But if our wickedness, verse 5, serves to show the justice of God, what's my wickedness? Now, circle the word wickedness. Remember, we've been looking at this word. Wickedness means, again, that the, the unbelievers that, that I've fallen off, that I've cut myself off, that i cut myself off from the living God. I cannot say I'm a man of God and, 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 and have Saturday night fun to the point of I'm degrading myself, I'm turning in myself. What's, what's all those signs? It's going back to Romans chapter 1 that I live like that. You see, if I'm a man of God, if I'm a woman of God, I don't do those things. You know why? Can I tell you why we don't do those things? Because you don't want to do them. How many know all of your eating has changed over the years? Most of us here wouldn't go near McDonald's right now. You look at that food though. You know, I, I haven't been to McDonald's in like about 10 years now. It's like, wow. And I like those, you know, cheeseburgers and everything else, you know? Because... My diet's changed. I don't chew gum. I, I, I don't have dentures, they're the real kind. But I'm afraid if I chew gum, this part will stick up to that part, I can't pull them two apart. <laughs> <laughs> and to me, you know, and I squeeze the juice out of it in about five seconds, I'm gonna spit it out. <laughs> so when you offer me gum, I say forget about it. You know, I just want, Amen? <laughs> so, the wickedness, look at verse 5, that God is unjust to inflict wrath on us. God doesn't inflict wrath on it. We bring ourselves in. What is wrath? Remember that word wrath? It's not preached in the church anywhere today. Have you noticed? Wrath is God hates sin. What is wrath? God hates wickedness. And if you decide to have wickedness in you, the wickedness has got to go. The wickedness is in you. You go. You got that? God doesn't want to throw anyone to eternal damnation or separation. But if you want to live a life that's vile 
And by the way, your life and my life has got to be consistent every day. Amen? You go to the communion. Amen? You should be living like you've been at the communion table every moment. Amen? You should, yes, I hope you all have fun. I hope you have joyous times, especially in these next two, three, four weeks coming up. I hope you have a joyous holy day season. But we should never do anything that discredits our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. And um, I always tell my kids, if you're going to the movies, I always ask them the question, is Jesus going with you? They just look at me like, they're very quiet all of a sudden. Amen? So what's the wrath? The wrath is against immorality, pornea. It's against all those things that 1 Corinthians 6 mentions to us. So how many here have consistent lives? And you know when you, the best part of your life is when you're really down, when you're by yourself. What are you doing by yourself? How many here are, are, are pure before the Lord God? Amen? If we say that God is unjust, I speak in a human way, verse 6, by no means, and how could God judge the world? But if, through my falsehood, God's fullness abounds to His glory. Why am I still being condemned as a sinner? What does it mean, my falsehood? How many were all false without God? Amen? What does it mean that I'm false because it's going to abound? What does that mean? God's going to save me because of my falsehood. And, and, and look what He did. Look what He did. Let's break that apart. For how could God judge the world? Now, put a little note there. John 3, 17. Jesus doesn't judge the world right now. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. John 3, 16. But John 3, 17. God did not come to condemn anybody. Nobody in this church is condemned. I can't get this across to us enough. You have never been condemned. People have condemned you. God's not disappointed in any of you. God didn't let any of you down. It's this crazy world that, and then you can connive in your, your mind saying that God let you down. He didn't let you down. He doesn't know how to let you down. Romans chapter 5 verse 2 says, if you're in God, you can't be disappointed. Wow. And so he doesn't judge this world. Because if, if he did, we'd all be hell bound. Next he says there, verse 7, but if you're my falsehood, am I false? Yes. How do I get false? By practicing religion that doesn't change me. I'm glad people go to church. I really am. And I hope more people come to church this weekend. But that's not going to save them. It's a relationship with Jesus that's going to save them. So how many are practicing falsehood? We can disagree, and I don't mind that we disagree. But I love all the part we do agree on. Amen? Through my falsehood, abounds to His glory. So everything I did wrong, He's going to get the glory because of what He's going to do for me. You got that? Now circle the word glory. I say glory in, in Greek. Doxas. D-O-X-A. Remember what doxa is? Let's tell you very quickly what doxa is. Through Him. With Him. In Him. How many ever heard of doxa now? That's the glory of God. So the glory, when I'm still being condemned as a sinner, does God condemn me? If you quickly go forward to Romans 8.1, there's no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. Good news? Nobody here is condemned. Would you do yourself a favor for the rest of your life? Don't let anybody condemn you. Can you I want you to do something. If anybody calls your name, you just put up your hand and say, look you. I don't accept that. I, I get strong at them and they run away from me. I rebuke that. I don't accept what you just said about me. I am not that person. I am a son of the Most High God. There. <laughs> Amen? Amen? Next he says there, And why do not evil that good may come? We've all done such evil. One sin can land us all in hell, can it? But guess what my evil did? It brought about the cross. Now listen, every one of us, listen to me very carefully. 
you are better off because Adam and Eve sinned than if you didn't. Wow, that's a statement. <coughs> you are better off now because Adam and Eve sinned than if you didn't. If Adam and Eve didn't sin, we'd all be in the garden going, waving at each other. <laughs> that would be good. The, that would be good, the glory of God. But because of our sins, it's going to be better because Jesus came to die for us. And we would never have, in all eternity, experience that kind of life and love. Now, I'm not giving anybody permission to go out and sin. Oh, I'm going to go sin tonight, Father Bill, so I feel better in the morning when I repent. No, 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 no. No, I'm not giving anybody permission to sin. But because of our sinfulness, there's our Savior. Amen? Are you getting this? Then he says there, and why do you got that people that, wouldn't they come? Now Paul keeps asking all these questions. Have you noticed that? As some people slander charges with saying, their con condemnation is just. So, what does Paul feel? He feels like he's being condemned, and what happens to the Gentiles, they're being condemned, and they deserve it. And Paul says, no. No, look at Romans 8, 1, there's no condemnation. Nobody's condemned. That's a miracle statement, isn't it? Now we have verse 9. If, if you look at all these verses, all the way down to verse 18, he uses scripture to tell us our condition. He uses all these scriptures. And if you really want to have a super full study, we've got to take one of those scriptures and go to the chapter and study the whole chapter. Okay? That should, that'll be an extended study on Romans. I mean, that's how to really, 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 really study it. Here's, here's our condition. What then? Are we Jews any better off? Now notice Paul's still saying we Jews. Now remember, Paul is walking with Jesus. Paul never stopped being Jews, Jewish, but he, he lived for Jesus Christ in a whole different manner than his Jewish people do. And can I tell you the biggest area I suffer in by doing that in my church? I don't follow what everybody else is doing. But yet, I claim to be with everybody else. But some people think, you're not like us. I said, I am. But you act differently. You're not normal. Imagine being called not normal. Are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. For I have already charged, verse 9, that all men, both Jews and Greek, see, see the Jews and Greek again? Why Jews? They, they're first to hear the what? The oracles. The Greeks are, are the educated. We're all under the power of sin. Okay, now let, let's build this up because we're going to get to the salvation message. If you understand this, you understand all of Paul. Now, here's a whole list of every of all the sins. Here's, here's our condition, amen? Now, you got to know your condition so you can get up to your position. But our position is with Jesus Christ. Are you, are, are you there with me? Ephesians chapter 1. We're all in position with the Lord Jesus Christ. Do I hear amen? amen? Now, here's the problem. We stay in our condition too long. Look at verse number um, 10. None is righteous, no, not one. Nobody here can walk by themselves and think you can get to heaven by yourself. Not one is righteous. Righteousness means, uh, uh, again, it's a big word in, in Romans. I told you the word many times. Diakosune. I'll spell it. I'll write down the word. Okay. Uh, D, again, you, you've seen me write this word many times. D-I-A-K-O-U-S. O U N E. Everybody say it. Diakosune. D I A K O U S O U N E. Righteousness means the life of God living through us. Nobody by themselves can have the life of God living through them. Nobody. Nobody. And so that's that's check number one. None of us are righteous. So, remember you were told years ago, good people go to heaven? That doesn't say that, does it? What does no one mean in Greek? No one. No one. You speak fluent Greek. No one understands. No one seeks God. Now, if it wasn't for God choosing me, John 15, I wouldn't go after him. I never decided that God should become a man and be born on Christmas. 
That is a far outstanding statement, way beyond my thinking. And guess what happened, brothers and sisters? Nobody on the entire planet thought about that. It was way beyond every single solitary human reach. No one thought God becoming man. It was... Now what do we do? We, we made up our gods. Remember what the Greeks had gods and the Romans had gods? You remember that? But guess what we did? Guess what we did when we made all those gods up? We came close, so to speak. We said, they are beyond us. And they have control over our human affairs. That's not the God who became man. That's not the incarnation. No one could grasp this. So when you get to Christmas celebration, nobody grasped that he would come like that. Nobody. Next he says there, verse number 12. All have turned aside. What does all mean? All. Oh. Together they have gone wrong. We've all done wrong. Amen? No one does good. Now circle the word good. How do you say good in Hebrew? To, 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 T-O-V. What's the first, what's the first word when God made us? It is good. To, to, to. Now notice, you got to get this now. In Genesis when he made us, man, woman, in the image and likeness of God, he said, to, and he got so excited about us, he went, me, to. Amen. Turn to the person next to you and say, you are me, to. Me, M-E-O-D, me, to. All right, turn to the person next to you and say, you are me, to. Me, to. You are very good. When you are a redeemed son or daughter, you are meto. I like it. Isn't that good? You're meto? Yeah, yeah. Now notice from that point on, after we sin in Genesis 3, he never called anybody meto again. When do you get meto? Remember in Mark chapter 10, the rich man came and what did he say? Dov. He said, Jesus, you are dov. What will happen when we all go to heaven and enter in? You will hear meto. Isn't that interesting? And what do we now say how to get to heaven? You've got to be good. So what do we say? You've got to be tov. But what do we just learn here? Nobody's good. No, not one. We've all done wrong. This is not exciting news for us. Now look at verse 13. Their throat is an open grave. Huh. How, many, how many can say amen to that? Anybody ever say bad words? How many know your grave is down here? Look right here, right there. See the grave right here? Right? It comes up from here. Because it's attached down here to the heart. It goes... Oh, I don't know where that came from. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> yes, Isaiah 6. Okay, you got what's coming out? Amen? Are you getting this? Now, their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. What's the greatest thing that, what's the greatest thing that we know we're of the, our old father? Lying. Nobody here lied before, right? I just saw a flash of lightning <laughs> over there. <laughs> what, what's the second thing? Deceiving one another. What's the third thing? Murder in our heart. Wow. He says there, now, boy, this is really strong. 13, the venom of asp is under their lips. You got the picture? How many ever seen, how many love snakes? What happens when a snake opens his mouth? What it, it comes out? <laughs> so what's, what does Paul say our tongues are? When we open this, out comes that little... Yes, it's a forked tongue. How many need correction on the tongue? Nobody, just me. So we're very aspy. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Wow. How many would like to have a renewed family? Tell everybody in your family, no more cursing. Every curse that goes on in your house, you're bringing curse in your house. Did you hear me? 
And what's the biggest tool of it? That flat screen TV. Every curse is staying in your house. Holy water. Amen. Amen. Next he says there, their feet are swift to shed blood. We kill one another. And their paths are ruin and misery. This is the condition of all of us, Jews and Gentiles. And the way of peace they do not know. Now what happened when, when John the Baptist was born? What did Zechariah say? He will lead people on the path of peace. To undo this curse. And who's that? Who's coming on the path of peace? The Lord Jesus. What is Jesus called? The Sar Shalom. Amen? Next he says there, There's no fear of God before their eyes. Now, everybody circle fear of God. What does fear of God mean? Reverence. I had the nuns were nuns were nuns. Did you have the nuns with the nuns were nuns? Yes. Sister always told me to bow my head at the name of Jesus. I don't see that anywhere today. You better do that. <laughs> how many would like to see holy reverence? In our local churches, how many would like to have reverence here? An awesome quiet. How many would like to have quiet? People pray. Reverence is gone. And by the way, if reverence doesn't return to the church, guess what happens? There's no wisdom in the church. Proverbs 1 7. You want to get, be a wise man or woman? It begins with the fear of God. It's the key to all of your wisdom. Amen. You want to be wise? What does wise mean? Being able to put things together again. Amen. We'll go down to verse 20. Now we know that whatever the law says, how many laws are there? It speaks to those who are under the law. So I'm not Jewish, and I don't want to be Jewish. So guess what I don't have to look at and study tonight? the 613 laws, because I'm not circumcised and for that respect. So I don't have to be born and do all of that. So if I'm, if I'm circumcised, guess what I gotta do? Genesis 17, I gotta do all of that, yes? But I don't have to do that because I'm not circumcised, I'm baptized. I'm baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And so guess what my life is? I don't have to keep kosher laws. Jesus ended the kosher law. And he was Jewish. And he was circumcised, wasn't he? Because he had to be born under the law to live it perfectly so that God would be appeased. Isn't it amazing about our God? He's appeased if one person can do it. Wow, is God good. Amen. God is good. So that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world be accountable to God. Now, when I look at the law, I can't do it. So what I got to do? Bill? Front and center. Yes? You kept 612 laws. Whew. That's a good 99 percentile, Lord. He says, no, I want 100 percent. And guess what? I don't measure up then. God's not on a curve. He's into perfection. Amen. Now, when we all go to heaven, you're all going to be perfect? Everybody say yes. Passing through the purgation fires, yes. We're all going to be perfect one day. Revelation 22, nothing defiled will ever go to heaven. Nothing defiled will be perfect in glory. Amen. Are you getting this? And so guess what? What's the law saying to me? The law is saying, I can't, I can't live like this. Guess what? When all this on me... What am I crying out inside me right now? I need help. What am I crying out? I need a savior. I can't do this. And the whole world may be accountable to God. So here now, the whole world's accountable to do this. For, look at verse 20. No human being will be justified in his sight by works of the law. Just because you do the works of the law and you're a 90 percentile, you can't stand in front of God until you do what? The whole thing perfectly. Whoa. Anybody need help right about now? Doesn't this have you call out, God help me? And you know what I discovered about all of us? We all still need that prayer. And look what he says there. And through the law comes knowledge of uh, what? Sin. 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 Alright, you give me a sick God? Says, oh, yeah, it's got up. 
You, you want to follow me? Yes, I do. Uh, here's 613 laws. Oh, okay. And Bill, yeah. Um, I want I want this done perfectly. Okay. Okay. I'll, and what do I do? I'll say, I'll try. I'll try. God doesn't say no. You got to do it. All right, I'll do it. And then I start, how many know, my first day of school, I sharpen all my pencils. I get all my notebooks ready. I do my homework the first day. But it's all. And I discovered I can't do it. And guess what happens? What does the 613 laws reveal to me? I'm in sin. I'm in, I'm in sin. I can't do it. And, and guess what? What do I do? I start crying. I can't make it. But now the righteousness of God has been manifest. No, underline the word manifest. It means they're taking the lid off. How can it? No, we're going to be righteousness. Day after Sunday. Remember that word? What does it, righteousness mean? God's life through me. What does it mean? That I can stand in front of God. How many here can stand in front of God right now? I can stand in front of God because of my life. Now, the righteousness, ready? That I can stand in front of God, ready? It doesn't happen when I obey the law because I can. So guess what? Here's the law. And guess what? I'm saved apart from that law. Whoa. Oh, this sounds good now. And guess what we grew up on? Obey the law. The law will keep you if you keep it. And what did we say? What did we all, what's the second thing we all said? Obey the Ten Commandments. But see everybody in this room? We all broke them. And so, this nomos, this Torah, which pre-existed in Jewish belief. Here it is. And now Paul makes this outrageous statement. I'm saved over here, not with the law. Wow, this is really outrageous now. You think he's getting any Jewish ears right now? What does manifest mean? Take the lid off. I'll give you the, the Greek word again. Phanero. P H A N E. R, O, O. Take the lid off. So how many here, where do we start? We start by saying, I can't. And then he says, although the law and the prophets, every circle that expression, law and the prophets. That's the Jewish Bible. The law and the prophets. Now there's three parts to the law and the prophets. Let, let's give you them all. Everybody, everybody write down T and K. T. The Torah. Everybody know what the Torah is? Yes. T and K. This is how to say the Jewish Bible. Tanakh. Everybody say Tanakh. 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 Everybody put down T and K. And in between all of the... the put, put the A in it. T-A and... Put the N in the, and the K. Put the A in it. Tanakh. T A N A K. Tanakh. Tanakh. All right, now let's give you the Jewish Bible and we're done. What's the T stand for? Torah. Torah. Here, write it on the board. T O R A H. What's the Torah? The first five books of the Bible. What's the N stand for? Nebiim. What's the Nebiim? The prophets. Prophets? N E B I I M. Nebiim. And then the Jewish people have the third part. Ketuvim. K-E-T-U-V-I-I-M. Ketuvim, which means the other writings like Job and Psalms and everything else. Now if you take those three things on Resurrection Sunday, I never, I never heard this preached. Jesus gave a Bible study on Resurrection Sunday. Does anybody know that? He told the apostles, in the Torah is my resurrection, in the Nebiim is my resurrection, in the Ketuvim, meaning the Psalms, is my resurrection. So all the parts of the T and K 
he, he gave a Bible study on the TNK. Today, if you're in Barnes and Noble or you're looking at the, the religious section and you see the Jewish section, you see the word Tanakh. It's another word for their understanding of the Bible. Torah, Nebim, Prophets, Ketuvim, the other writings like Job and the Psalms and Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. You got that? Now, circle the word law and the prophets. Anybody know two famous people, the law and the prophets? Moses and Elijah. Do you ever hear those two? Moses and Elijah. This is what he says. And we're done. But now the righteousness of God, the Apostune, has been manifested. Salvation is not in the law. How many of people are getting blown away? Did they have the book of Romans? No. Did they have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in the 50s? No. So when they're hearing Paul write this, they're like, you're saying, can we do this stuff to Paul? Remember, there was, a, there was a Christian community there before Paul ever visited. We don't know how it got there. In glory, we'll find out. Then he says there, apart from the law, apart from those 613, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. What's, what's the law? Torah. What's the prophets? The Nebi. See the T and the N. Now circle that. It's another Jewish way of saying the Bible. He says, apart from what you already have in the Bible, there's more coming. Well, this is mind blowing. Because they didn't turn the pages of Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Amen. They didn't get into all that because apart from what you have, there's something more coming. And you've got to see this more coming because this will explain to you because you only have the law and the prophets. And now, the Jewish people and my dear, dear Orthodox friend, I love them to death. They only stick with the first part, the law. Does he talk about the other part? Yes. But you know how much? He speaks hours and hours and hours and hours on the first part and about five minutes on the second part. One day I asked him about the famed Isaiah 53, which is the crucifixion of Jesus. And I said, Rabbi, what do you think of Isaiah 53? He got a little nervous. And he says, oh, you know what Isaiah 53 is? Tell me. He said, it's Israel being fully redeemed one day. Okay. If you, have, have we all read, uh, how many of we all read Isaiah 53 every Good Friday? By stripes we are healed, Isaiah 53, 54. He couldn't explain to me. And he, he's a brilliant man, more brave than I will ever be. He's brilliant. But he couldn't explain it to me. I thought, he, I thought he gave me a weak thing. So who's the law and the prophets? You can think of Elijah and Moses. Remember the transfiguration? Some of you are with me on the Mount of Transfiguration. Amen? Are you getting this? That's a second Jewish way of saying the Bible, the law and the prophets. The third way of saying the Jewish uh, is Torah. The other way is, we just did it, Tanakh. T-A-N-A-K. Tanakh. Law and the Prophets, and, and Torah. Torah does mean the first five books of the Bible, but it can mean the whole Bible. But today, if you meet your Jewish Orthodox friends, they're fixated, fixated on Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Fixated. Do they read the others? Yes. But they're fixated. Now, when you go to church on Sunday, what are we fixated on? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Have you noticed that? We're fixated on that. All the sermons you're going to hear probably for the rest of your life, fixated on it. So what, I, what I've done in my life, I always go to the first reading, or today I did Zephaniah, because I want you to understand the juice in the other parts of the scripture. Amen? Good stuff? Yes? All the scripture. All the songs.
he's crushed Bible referencing. And look at all the quotes he gave. Now, there is a rule. When you quote a scripture in the New Testament, you know that rule, Sister Celeste? When you wrote one Bible verse in the New Testament from the Old Testament, you've got to go back and study the whole chapter. So if we did that, we'd be here to the soon second coming. <laughs> yes. So do you, do you understand what he was saying? He was saying to them, here's one line from, from Psalm 33. Here's one line from Psalm 33. Now, you go back and study the whole chapter in Hebrew. Okay? Everybody got that? Now, we'll be with you in two weeks from now. There's a penance service in my church. So, I don't think there's going to be a lot there, but I didn't get a straight answer from my boss, so I, I better be there. Just So, we'll see you in two weeks from now. And um, I, I think uh, we can tell uh, Holly and, above all, Father Tom, uh, the, uh, if we want to do it on a Thursday night in January here, would you like that? If Father Tom says yes and their schedule permits. We could do the healing mass here. I don't. I would have to have the January schedule in front of me to commit to a Saturday morning. If you want to wait till January comes, and then I could see what the schedule is that Father has for me before I make a commitment to a uh, to a Saturday morning. Okay. If you want Saturday morning, we'll go for Saturday morning. So the next one from the twenty seventh. Okay, so we'll, we'll do the 27th. We'll continue chapter 3 and chapter 4. We're still on the introduction part to Romans. Are you getting, really, are you getting Romans? Are you sure? Is your boyfriend getting it? He's sliding around. We're, we're, he was over there and now he's moving all over the place here. Does everybody know that Jesus is the way, truth, and life? Yes. Did you follow okay? In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. Father, we can't save ourselves. And in the beautiful 12 days from now, we'll, we'll commemorate the birth of the Lord Jesus. Save us with that miraculous birth that Jesus is the God-man. He has come for me personally so that I may have a mansion with him in glory. I say yes to what you have for me, Lord. And Lord, I don't live the way I should, but I'm not going to put myself down. You bring me up, Lord. Bring me up to who you are that I can hear your actual heart beat. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God bless you. And if I don't see you, for some of you, have a great holy Christmas, okay? Amen.